Cool. So yes, you're you're loud and clear. So um, you've been uh, listening in on the on the feed here, um, and so uh, I just wanted to give you a chance to say a few words. Okay, um, and I'm an economist. I mean, you've had lawyers and you've had people who've been looking at data and people who are trying to do policy. Um, and so I look at it from a slightly different perspective, and I want to emphasise two things. First of all, as other speakers have said, we live in a very imperfect world. And what you're trying to do is get on with malaria treatment research in that very imperfect world. So I'd like to emphasize what others have said, that you can do successful um, pharmaceutical development without patents. And Paul has a link I've sent down to some very good work with, by Baldwin and Levine, pages 259 to 260 where they list the 46 top pharmaceuticals in the world and show how many of them were developed without patents and how some of the ones that were developed with patents were actually developed serendipitously so that it wasn't the patent incentive that led to them. Um, now, the other thing that I think from this morning's speaker is Mary emphasized that open source will work best for the very earliest stage of pharmaceutical development. And this is where one of the things that you also need to take care of, as well as patents, is copyright. Because data, copyright in this country, it doesn't have to be creative for there to be copyright. So that data is covered by copyright. And you might very well find that in sharing data in that early stage open source delivery, you can look to the copy left provisions of the open software movement to try and ensure that people don't free ride on what you're doing, but are able to participate if they're able to share. So a lot of people today have talked about so-called intellectual, so-called property, but I beg you not to. It's a meaningless phrase. It's like saying the world, because the nature of patents and the nature of copyright and the nature of trademarks are very different. And that term, so-called intellectual, so-called property, is, is very imprecise. And it's very difficult to know what you're talking about if you use that term rather than talking about patents. The other thing that is important about patents is you need to understand that there is almost no inventiveness required to get a patent. You can patent something as simple as teaching your children about finance by having them work for their pocket money. And this is true. This has been patented in Australia. It's a current patent here. Um, so you'll find that there are an awful lot of patents operating in an area where you might be working, but they may very well not be killer patents in any sense. So unless you have money that's worth the patent owner suing you about, you can just get on with things and you don't need to worry about patents. And as other people have said, I mean, most research organizations, regardless of the lack of a clear research exemption, just get on and do it. Um, and I include SIRO in that because I know that their scientists don't go and talk to their patent lawyers until they start to have products. The European Union investigated pharmaceuticals a few years ago and found that there could be thousands of patents on a single molecule. I think that shows you how little inventiveness you need from one patent to another. So you need to be aware of it. When you're coming to things that look successful, you need to talk to your university's patent lawyer about how to patent, because you can take out a patent and then you can open license it. So if you have patents you own, you can make them consistent with what you're trying to do in an open source way, while still satisfying the need that some, but not all, venture capitalists have for patents. It's often claimed that venture capitalists won't fund you if you don't have patents. The academic research on that is much less clear. Yes, there are claims by some venture capitalists that they must have a patent, 
But there is also evidence showing that other venture capitalists just look at what you've got rather than patenting, uh, whether you've got patents. So I think you need to look at copyright um, for how you share your data in the first instance. I think you need to use your university IP experts as you progress to look at patents. Um, but, and you, I don't know, I mean, the patent lens is very useful, but the problem, as Richard said, is that most patents are written in such a way that they're very, very difficult to access. And patent lawyers specialise in removing keywords from the patent description so that other people can't find what they're doing. Uh, I don't know if you remember when Australia won the America's Cup, but the keel had been patented in the Netherlands. And there was a lot of speculation about the keel and what it looked like. And nobody found the diagram sitting there in the Dutch patent office until after the race had been won. But as well as your research, I'd like to suggest that as academics, you might want to take an interest in a couple of things on the policy front. Um, an earlier speaker mentioned how bad many universities' IP policies are. And certainly where I am, the ANU, our IP policy is simply dreadful. Um, I would encourage you to take an active interest in it. And I would particularly encourage you to ensure that your university's so-called IP policy, that each clause specifies exactly what kind of monopoly they're talking about. Is it a patent monopoly? Is it a copyright monopoly? Or do they want to have the unwritten ideas in your own mind? Because all of those are included in universities' policies. I'd also encourage you to save some of your time and boycott Elsevier. Elsevier, as you know, is a Dutch publishing company which has recently funded two American Congress people, a Republican and a Democrat. And those two people funded by Elsevier have sponsored the Research Works Act, which was tabled just before Christmas and comment closed in the middle of January. And the intent of that act is to make it illegal for taxpayer funding bodies such as the National Institute of Health to require those who receive their grants to make their data available to the public. Now, there is a uh, web link where you can sign up and you can refuse to be on their editorial boards, you can refuse to um, referee any articles submitted, and you can even refuse to submit to their journals. I'll send a link on that through to Paul. Um, but look, I think it is possible. I think it's going to be hard. Uh, I think that the world that we've created does make it challenging. Well, one of the things I would suggest, given that you're working on malaria, is that you ask Bill Gates to see whether he can't look at getting some of the stuff behind the Orphan Drugs Act available for neglected diseases. Now remember, Bill Gates is as rich as he is today because his daddy was an IP lawyer. And Bill Gates learned an awful lot very early on about the importance of grabbing patents and the importance of using copyright. Now, the essence of the US Orphan Drugs Act is it bypasses the whole of patents and copyright. And what it does is it says, use the drug approval body in your country to provide for the final product a guaranteed period of exclusivity in the market where nobody else can challenge it. So it's quite different from patents. Because as Richard said, a patent is simply a license to sue. The Orphan Drugs Act gives you a license to sell and it prevents anybody else competing for you for that specific approved product in the marketplace. Now, if we could get a system like that that was a global system in so that you could get the size of the market and bring it through to a number of different countries so that you could cover the countries that are the main market, then that would provide an incentive for people to fund the very expensive phase three clinical trials that eat the very large part of money. Now that's the end of that process that Mary was talking about when she spoke this morning. So it's the bit where some public money is going in uh, 
in areas like malaria research, but where there's a tendency for people to feel it should be privately funded. I mean, there is an argument that it should be publicly funded because, of course, when a proprietary company that has a new product is doing the phase three clinical trials, there is, as we've seen, an incentive for that company to suppress worrying data. Um, so if, if you prefer public funding at that stage and you're finding governments to say, well, why should we pay for this when normally the private sector does, the argument is that that last regulatory stage is a stage that is done in the public interest to protect the public health, to make sure that a new product on the market is safe and effective, and that there is a very good argument for that being publicly funded, not privately funded. I think that's all I've got to contribute. I hope it's useful, but good luck with your work. I think what you're doing is terrific. Great, thank you, Hazel. Is, is there anyone who's got a question while Hazel's on the line? Yeah, we, we have uh, one question, if you could just hang on for a second. Just one small thing, Hazel. You said that um, there is copyright in data. Now, just to clarify, I think my, my understanding is slightly different. My understanding is that because Australia is a common law fiction and therefore has a sweat of the brow doctrine, the copyright actually inheres in compilations of data as opposed to, for example, raw data as it comes with machines and so on. Subtle but very important, very important difference. So if you put a compilation of data together, if you add metadata to it, that falls on the sweat of the brow and it needs to, needs to also fulfill um, a threshold of originality. Or it, 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 there has to be a minimum threshold of originality that your compilation meets before it can be protected. But the same, I think, is not true for raw data. We've got an IP lawyer in the, in the, in the room. Is that, is, that, is that right for Australia? Um, it very, you're right, it varies from country to country, but um, um, I think the High Court recently um, held, I think it was the ICE uh, TV uh, case, that you can't, you can't have patent protection and essentially... Um, <laughs> ...data that you generate yourself, um, uh, Depending on how you formulate it. Sorry. Yeah, depending on depending on the way you present that data, you might be able to get some form of copyright protection in the method of well, in its presentation, but not in its raw state. No. For example, if you set up your project. There are unfortunately other ways to protect data, um, and um, for instance, uh, within the within the pharmaceutical framework, the regulatory framework, there are data exclusivity provisions, um, which apply regardless of copyright and regardless of the patents. So information which is provided to a a, a pharmaceutical regulator by a company that's sponsoring a drug through the system um, is now um, able to protect that data for a period of five years in Australia. In Europe, it's up to 10 years. Uh, in the United States, it's five years, and it, it varies. Um, but there are significant uh, uh, push, there's a significant push to extend out that period of data exclusivity. So it, it just depends on the nature of the data, what it's being used for. And um, I think also um, in Europe there are some fairly stringent um, provisions as well. So you've got to look beyond intellectual property. Copyright isn't just the be all.
Uh, Hazel, did you want to, um, I had a couple of questions if you didn't want to come back on that immediately. No, I mean that kind of gets into kind of technical legal areas. I, I, um, my understanding was simply that there was no creativity requirement. I'm not at all across the issue of just how much sweat, but I would have thought there would be quite a lot when you're doing that early stage development. Right. So the, um, there are two questions that we often get when we talk to people about the idea of open source drug discovery. Um, and the, the first is, well, um, why do we need to, why would we need to take a patent which we then license freely to other people? What is the purpose of doing that if our university decided to, to, to take that route? Um, that's the first question. The second question that we often get is, um, if you release all of your data on a project openly on the internet, what is to stop somebody else, for example, a company coming along taking that and patenting what you've done and thereby restricting access to it. Well, you only wanted to talk about it. Those, those, two, those two questions we often get asked, and I often try and fumble an answer to, but it'd be interesting to hear your perspective. And also yours, Luigi, if you've got an answer for those two questions. Well, the two questions are very good questions, right? Um, the first one, why would you want to take out a patent? The patents are an extremely nasty form of monopoly. The patent, patent, um, Richard put it in the terms, the patent gives you the right to sue. The patent doesn't actually give you the right to do anything. What it gives you is the right to stop other people using exactly the same invention that you've come up with, whether they've invented it independently or not. So that the holder of the patent can stop other people going on with what they're doing. And that is why you need to patent. You don't, if you hold a patent, you don't have to use it in that way. That's a particularly nasty business model that certain companies have developed, but it is not compulsory. So you could hold a patent and you could put it on the web and you could say, everybody is welcome to use this freely, or you could do it a different way. You could say more quietly, you could say, this is available on a common license. We're going to license to everybody. We're not going to ask very much money, just a little bit. Right? So that was the first question, and I've kind of forgotten the second one. Can you remind me? The, uh, the oh, the data. Uh, Putting the data out. What, what, yeah, what's to stop somebody coming along and patenting something that you've yeah. done in the open, and thereby restricting your access to it? Well, I would, I would have a bit of a chat to, in this country, to IP Australia, and I would tell them where's your website that you're going to put everything on, and I would ask them to draw that to the attention of examiners, so that if anybody is claiming you know, any of that is new, there it is in the public arena, it is not new. But you will have to do that very actively because the poor old examiners do tend to look only at what's already in a patent document. They don't tend to look very broadly at non-patented documents and you don't want to waste your time looking at all the other potential applicants that are flying into the patent office. And if you're, you take your eye off the game, they will charge you at least $1,300 to oppose somebody else's patent, which is much more expensive than applying for the patent in the first place. So, but if you, if you talk to IP Australia, if you approach the Commissioner of the Patents and say, look, we're doing this, this is our website where we're going to put it up, we would ask that all the patent examiners, and do it in writing as well, but go and see her, um, that should help in this country, and you might want to see in a couple of other key countries if you can get the same access and, and take the same approach. But something that is in the public arena cannot be patented, technically. Okay, yeah, I mean, that's the basic point, isn't it? That if it's publicly disclosed, it can't be patented, so we're... That's the theory. Yeah, <laughs> okay, good. Have to test it out. Um, okay, thank you very much, Hazel. We um, we might uh, move on now.